many of you have heard of the Passion of the Christ? Raise your hand if you've heard of the Passion of Christ. All right. Uh, probably many of you are raising your hands because uh, of the movie called The Passion of the Christ, right? But long before the movie, uh, there was the phrase, the passion of the Christ. And people use that phrase. It's not necessarily a, well, it's not a biblical thing. You're not going to find those words or that phrase in the Bible. Uh, but you do hear uh, people from time to time in books and commentaries, you know, wherever you might be uh, reading things or hearing people speak. Uh, they might mention the passion of the Christ referring to Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, his, uh, betray his arrest, his betrayal. Um, you know, the, the what's the, the, the court scene I'm looking for? Um, when he's on trial, there's the word I was looking for, trial, thank you. Uh, the trial, uh, all the way to the crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection. People will encompass, and sometimes even more than that, the ascension and everything else. Sometimes people will uh, encompass like all of that. They'll refer to that as the passion of the Christ. At some point in time, this uh, zealousness that the Lord had for finishing the work, uh, completing the plan that God had set before him, God the Father uh, had come up with, uh, they refer to those events as the passion of the Christ. And then, of course, along came the 2004 Mel Gibson film of the, the same name, right? Uh, but this past week, when you're doing your reading, I hope that you saw the compassion of the Christ, did you, did you notice a theme woven throughout Matthew chapters 14 through 20? It's, it's in more of our reading that we've done so far, even before this week. We, we talked about and heard about compassion, right? I'm calling this morning's message the compassion of the Christ because so far we've seen a lot of this compassion of the Christ. A couple of weeks ago during your reading, uh, you would have heard Jesus quote to the Pharisees, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. And... Um, multiple places uh, we hear about this compassion. He tells the Pharisees, uh, I desire compassion, not sacrifice. He tells them, go and learn what this means. Go and learn what he means, what the scriptures meant by that statement, right? And then later on, he would say, um, if you had known what this means, and he's referring to that statement, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Compassion is a very important thing to Jesus. Very important. So uh, this week, as you read Matthew chapters uh, 14 through 15, there were multiple mentions of the compassion of Jesus. Uh, the word compassion was mentioned in Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 18, and Matthew chapter 20. It's all over there. But if you look hard enough, if you read closely enough, slowly enough, paid attention to it enough, you would have seen uh, his demonstrating compassion multiple times. Even when the word isn't there, you see Jesus being compassionate rather than holding people to the letter of the law, uh, to what they deserve. He instead shows compassion. You see it over and over, and the word, like I said, pops up at least five times. And there was even one instance where Jesus said of himself, he said, I feel compassion for the people, right? So it wasn't just the gospel writers that wrote about him having compassion. It wasn't just that uh, we hear the word compassion. Jesus even said, hey, I feel compassion for these people. You can't miss it if you're reading closely enough. And I hope a, a, kind of a light bulb uh, just kind of went off and you're like, oh yeah, maybe I didn't think about it. And that's totally fine. But now that you say it, yes, compassion again and again. So, so what does this mean? Or what, what kind of effect should this have on us? Jesus uh, keeps bringing up compassion. The gospel writers make mention of his compassion. We see him exercising or demonstrating compassion. Well, I'll tell you this, if there's a theme of compassion in Jesus's ministry, perhaps we should take at least a Sunday morning and talk about it. Have a, have a little discussion time here, okay? That's what we're going to do. Uh, the funny thing about compassion, if you think about it, I would say everybody wants it. Everybody wants others to give them, to show them compassion, but far less have an actual desire to give that compassion. Does that make sense to you guys? People want compassion, but they don't want to give compassion. Not nearly as many. I'm not saying everybody, but not nearly as many. However, if we look at Jesus' compassion, we see that compa his, his compassion was often chosen over what may have been competing against it. Like Jesus, Jesus had options, and he picked compassion over and over. That, that's what I really want us to, that's going to be the theme of the message this morning, is this, this competition uh, where we have options, and we need to choose compassion. Uh, Jesus, when faced with a choice, chose compassion over those things that might have caused somebody to say, uh, maybe some other time. 
I understand what will be good for them, but maybe, maybe some other time. Right now, it's, it's not a good time. Or, or they don't really, they have it, what have they done to deserve it? Or, you know, there are things that compete with our desire, whether we want to show compassion or not. Jesus chose it every time, okay? Um, we face these decisions over and over. Daily opportunities to, to either hold somebody to the letter of the law or to show compassion. To take opportunities that are rightly ours or to, to, to step back and show compassion. And again, Jesus' ministry clearly says show compassion. So turn to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14 where Jesus shows us, first of all, the lesson of choosing compassion over convenience. Compassion over convenience. Uh, when opportunities present themselves to do what is compassionate or to do what is convenient... Jesus demonstrated time after time that compassion is the right choice. Look at Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 13. Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 13. The Bible says, Now when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a secluded place by himself. And when the people heard this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. Now, Hopefully you, you read this this past week and hopefully you're familiar with what ha has happened when it says Jesus heard about John. What happened? Well, what did he hear about John? Jesus had just lost his cousin John, right? Had just lost him. Had just lost the prophesied forerunner to his ministry and, and it was a gruesome loss. It was a tragic death, right? <clears throat> King Herod, who was having this immoral romantic relationship with his brother's wife, he, he ends up uh, having her, ends up having her, inviting her and her, her, it'd be his niece, her daughter, ends up having them both over for this great party, this feast <clears throat> with all of his friends, and he ends up having his own niece dance before this crowd, dance before him and before his buddies who are at this party. It's, it's a sick scene. He enjoys it so much that he promised her whatever she wanted. Sadly, for John the baptizer, uh, this girl's mom said, uh, I want the ask for, she wanted this. She said, ask him for the head of John the baptizer on, on, on a platter, literally. Like we, we use the phrase that they could literally did it. Brought his head on a platter. After all, he was the one, John was the one who's publicly calling out their immoral, unlawful relationship. Uh, King Herod and his brother's wife, right? So Herod had John beheaded there in prison. Can you imagine now, uh, we just read that one little verse that said when Jesus heard about John. That's what happened. That's what he heard about John. Can you imagine Jesus receiving that news, hearing that information, the significance of John's relationship with Jesus, the, the understanding that Jesus would have had about that, that just sick relationship, that wrong relationship between Herod and Herodias, uh, knowing that his cousin's death was ultimately because of, of some immoral, filthy foolishness going on at a party by this king. Because of that stupidity, because of that immorality, his cousin is gone. Our text says that Jesus received the news and withdrew to a secluded place by himself. Got in a boat, withdrew to a secluded place by himself. But what happened when he withdrew? Second half of verse 13 says that people heard about it and they followed him on foot. They heard about that, that he got in a boat and he took off. Okay? Maybe they don't know what he just found out. Maybe they don't know what has happened exactly. They haven't heard, I don't know. But they followed him. Sometimes the timing is inconvenient. Sometimes the circumstances are going to be inconvenient. Uh, the truth is it's often inconvenient to show compassion towards someone. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find a situation where you aren't giving something up. You aren't letting go of some opportunity, something you're entitled to, uh, some, something you could do. Uh, instead, you'd be hard-pressed to find some situation where you're showing compassion and, and you're not giving something up. I, I'm not sure... I'm not sure that you can show compassion unless you've given something up, given some ground up at least, something like that. Well, in the midst of this, this time that I'm sure Jesus would have liked to have spent uh, praying and grieving and thinking, he was interrupted by this crowd of people who had followed him and needed him. And Jesus showed compassion. Verse 14 says, When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. And guys, I want you to know, Jesus spent the rest of the day helping these people. He didn't just say, 
okay, fine, what do you want? And then did something for him real quick. Spent the rest of the day, right? L- look, if, you're, if you've got it up in your Bible, I don't have it up here on the screen, but if you've got your Bible open, look at verse 15. It says, when it was evening, the disciples came to him. When Jesus saw that crowd had compassion and started healing them, he did it until evening uh, and beyond probably, right? The disciples just came up to talk to him at that point in time, right? He spent the rest of his day healing those who were sick. Despite the timing, despite the situation, the circumstances, the scenario, despite the inconvenience of it all, Jesus was helping these people. What should we do when it's bad timing? What should we do when the the situation uh, doesn't make it easy or doesn't lend itself to to convenient compassion? What, What should we do? Well, right now, I'm really trying to focus on my studies. Right now, I'm really busy working on my house. Right now, my time is pretty much spoken for, you know, because of the kids and all. Right now, I'm still grieving the loss of this loved one. Right now, I'm still uh, trying to keep up with the NFL playoffs. Right now, I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life. Right now, I'm still trying to, I'm I'm mostly focused on trying to win my, my family to Christ. Okay, even still, the example says, show compassion. Make time to help people who need help, no matter who they are. Sacrifice some you time for some them time. Provide for the needs of others still. Choose compassion over convenience. Secondly, Jesus shows us the lesson of choosing compassion over odds. Choose compassion over odds. Uh, We've all had times where we justified not showing compassion because we said it was highly unlikely that my efforts would help or that my dollar would be noticed, or that my time would be appreciated. Uh, Sometimes we just don't think that what we have or what we can do will actually make a a significant difference. To us, the odds are just not in favor. In this situation, the odds are just not in favor of me being able to show compassion in a way that's going to make any kind of difference. But look at the situation in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, starting verse 32, the Bible says, And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat and I do not want to send them away hungry for they might faint on the way. The disciples said to him, where would we get so many loaves in this desolate place to satisfy such a large crowd? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few small fish. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and the fish and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people and they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets full. And those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. Jesus doesn't acknowledge the odds here. I'm not saying that he didn't recognize them. Maybe he knew the situation looked, it appeared impossible uh, to man, but he didn't waver in his efforts to help these people, did he? He chose compassion over whatever the odds were or looked like, right? Jesus, I want you to think about this. Jesus had the words of life to, to provide to people. The message of the kingdom, the good news of salvation. He had been anointed to preach the gospel, to proclaim release to the captives, to give sight to the blind, to free the oppressed. But he also recognized that these people around him had been listening and physically following him for three days now. And he knew they needed some food to sustain their strength. He's got big, important spiritual goals and he's on a mission. But he saw people's needs here and even beyond the odds that would say, well, you can do this. This this preaching and all that, that's your gig, but what about all these people, and what about what little your disciples have to to help in this? He felt compassion for these people, and he intended to show show them his compassion, to demonstrate that compassion by helping, by feeding them. Excuse me. Great story, right? Nice idea, but how? The disciples keyed in on this one little problem pretty quickly, didn't they? They said, where would we get so many loaves in this desolate place for, or to satisfy such a large crowd? The disciples were talking about the odds, weren't they? Right? Isn't that odds figuring language, right? They, they were selling it. 
The odds to them were against them in being able to provide the food for these people, and they were selling the fact that, that the odds are not in our favor at all. You hear the odds figuring language? Where would we get the food? Where would we get so many loaves to satisfy these people, especially in this desolate place, to satisfy such a large crowd? You hear it? We don't know where we would go to get what's needed. It would take so much to help. We're in the middle of nowheresville, and this crowd is so large. But how does Jesus handle the situation here in Matthew chapter 15? He doesn't say, ah, hmm, yeah, you're right. We probably couldn't make a dent in this crowd, a crowd of this size, especially, like you said, all the way out here in the middle of nowhere. Jesus asks, what do you have? Not what, what do we not have, what are we missing? He says, what do you have? What can we work with, right? His quote, his direct quote, how many loaves do you have? That's what Jesus asked. Now, I believe there are a number of us here at Liberty who aren't afraid to ask the question, what can I do for the Lord? It's one thing to ask it. It's another thing to say, here's the things that I can do. And to say, I can probably do more than I think, right? Right? But there's a lot of us, and, and I love this, a lot in this congregation who would say, what can I do for the Lord? But personally, I know sometimes I'm guilty of forgetting that I can't do anything for the Lord without the Lord. So as you're, as you're thinking, as you're quickly analyzing situations and making a quick call, a judgment in your mind real fast on what the odds look like, let's remember that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, that with God all things are possible. And in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, he said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's not be too hasty in dismissing our ability to show compassion simply because the circumstances that we can see and with our logic, they appear difficult or they appear unlikely to produce the results that we desire. Choose compassion over odds. Next, Jesus shows us the lesson of choosing compassion over debts. Choosing compassion over debts. Now, we're not talking about, uh, not just talking about financial debts here, but Jesus does use a financial debt story to explain how we must choose. Not should, not it'd be really great, or you'd be a, a high level person if you did. We must, we have to choose compassion even when, and especially when, people don't deserve it. <laughs> when people deserve actually something else. When they have it coming. When it's the right thing for them to have. Take a look with me at Matthew chapter 18. This is where Jesus teaches a, a lesson with a parable here. Uh, it's, a, it's a common, easy to understand story thrown alongside a powerful spiritual truth. Matthew chapter 18, starting verse 21. Wednesday night crew, this is going to sound familiar. It says, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason... The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and he seized him and began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and they came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly father, this is Jesus speaking, remember. He says, my heavenly father will also do the same to you if each one does not forgive, each one of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. <clears throat> So we saw that this parable was prompted by uh, Peter asking about how often a person ought to forgive their brother. And Peter offers up uh, this, you know, wonderful 
uh, very considerate, um, you know, answer, uh, this idea of you know, seven times. I mean, is seven times probably enough? And you might expect to say like, boy, that's, I, I, I come from three strikes and you're out, you know. So Peter, man, he says seven. And Jesus says, I'm thinking something more like 70 times seven. <laughs> what Jesus is driving at is as many times as your brother needs forgiveness and he listens and repents. If he needs it again later on, again, show him forgiveness. Now, in this parable, uh, the king represents Jesus. The, the slave whose master is the king, those, those slaves that are indebted, uh, th that's us. And then, of course, this astronomical amount that the slave is indebted uh, for, uh, that, that amount that's been amassed, that's, that's our sin. That's a picture of our sin. So Jesus, he paints this picture of this slave who owed a debt that he could never have repaid. The amount, uh, 10,000 talents, probably represents somewhere between 150,000 to 160 something thousand years worth of wages. It would take that long to earn these wages if you made the average amount for a day laborer in that day. Now, if you made a thousand times that amount, divide that by a uh, thousand, and you still have 150 to 160 something years worth uh, of time that it would take for you to earn that amount. Now, now understand, that's to earn it. You've got regular living expenses. Uh, he's clearly got a wife and children, right? They were on the, the selling block there for just a moment, you know. Uh, things were looking uh, pretty rough for them, too. They were involved. They were attached to his debt. He had done that. He had involved other people in his sin. Anyway, he's got wife and children here to feed. So, if it takes you 150, 160 some odd years to earn that money, how long is it going to take you to save that money? It's going to take a lot longer because you've got to feed yourself. You've you got to pay your bills and you have to save up that money. So this guy is in rough shape. He could never have repaid this. Here's what I want us to understand. I want to make sure we understand this. This slave owed that money. You know what that means to owe that money? T today you have to say this because a lot of people sign up for They sign up for things they say they're going to do. And they know good and well they might not be able to do that. Some people will do it and, and they know they can't do that. But I'm going to have the thing for a little while and, and I'm going to dare them to come take it, right? So it has to be explained, this guy owed that debt. It was a legal obligation. It was his debt. It wasn't something that had been thrown in his lap. He took it upon himself. He signed up for the debt. It was what he wanted at the time that he took out the debt. It was his responsibility. And so the master had every right to execute any legal form of recourse that he had available to him. In this situation, in this context, he could have sold him. He could have thrown him into debtor's prison. He had options available to him that, that, were, that were correct, legal, just forms of recourse. However, when this slave pleaded for patience and demonstrated or expressed a desire to, to reconcile in some way, to, to try to figure out how to handle this debt, and try to, to pay his master back. Verse 27 says, the Lord of that slave, who was the Lord, who was the king, the master here? Jesus. The Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. The slave asked for patience. Just, just asked for patience. And the king felt compassion freed the slave, forgave him of the debt. Just one problem, right? The freed and forgiven slave, what did he do? He went out, found a fellow slave who owed him some money, and he tried to choke the money out of the guy, refused to allow the man any time to save up the three or four months wages that he owed. And he even had him thrown in prison. Now this guy, this other guy that owed far less, he also owed the money the debt was indeed his responsibility to repay and the recently uh, freed of the, the 10,000 talents, that slave, by all means, he had every right to throw him into prison. But given the circumstances, this was clearly a moment where the right thing, not the legal thing, I'm not saying it's illegal, but legally could have thrown him in prison, could have had him punished, but, but the right thing to do right here was not hold him to the letter of the law, but instead to show compassion and forgive like his master had done for him, right? Now church, it's so, so easy to look at this slave and to see how wrong his actions were. 
It's so easy. He was forgiven, we'll say, 150,000 years worth of wages and then went off to strangle a guy who owed him a few months worth and even had him thrown into prison. How often are we guilty of holding to the letter of the law when we're owed debts that aren't of a financial nature? How often do we see, we look at someone and we see a debt in our minds and it prevents compassion or it creates a hesitation to show compassion because in our mind when we look at that person they owe a debt not not a financial thing you know we think things like I've done so much for them I, I don't need to help them now that they, they owe me they embarrassed me in front of some really important people they owe me an apology I wouldn't help them if they were the last person on earth after how they let me down I've been part of this church a lot longer than they have. They ought to be helping me, not me helping them. Well, they don't know what the Bible says about X, Y, or Z, so I'm going to keep my distance until they prove to me that they've figured things out. Or that person is still lost in their sins. I'm not helping them. They, they need to suffer a little bit and feel the consequences to recognize their sinfulness first. Uh, otherwise, sure, you know, I, I'd help out if it wasn't for that. Have you ever been guilty of, of figuring up the debt in ways like these? And have you ever decided to take the law into your own hands and, and you decide and, and execute what you think that person deserves or, or withhold from them what you think they don't deserve? Think about showing them compassion instead. Because after all, remember in our story, the king found out about the uncompassionate, heartless slave, didn't he? The one who choked his brother and threw him into prison. And the king called him... Starts with a W, ends with wicked. <laughs> wicked. He called him wicked and he handed him over to the torturers to be tortured until he could repay back what he owed. I said until he could repay back what was owed. How long would that be? Forever. Yeah, forever. He was never going to get away from these torturers, never going to be released from prison because he owed a debt he couldn't repay. So if he's going to be there until he could repay it, that's forever. He'll never get out of that and that parable ends Jesus says in verse 35 my heavenly father will do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart I'm telling you choose compassion over debts and then finally last one Jesus shows us the lesson of compassion over blindness Compassion over blindness. When we come to Matthew chapter 20, yesterday's reading, there were, there were two blind men. Hopefully you remember this one. It, hopefully it's fresh in your minds. There were these two blind men who called out to Jesus, and Jesus was, the Bible says, moved with compassion. Take a look at Matthew 20 uh, with me, starting in verse 29. The Bible says, As they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him, and two blind men sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd sternly told them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called to them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. Now, I hope that yesterday when you read this, I hope that you visualized the scene uh, at least a little bit in your minds. Jesus and his followers walking out of Jericho, uh, the, the dust kind of coming up behind uh, the crowd there as they're, they're traveling on their way out, uh, the city right behind them, and, and you know, uh, somewhat of a, a, a wilderness road out in front of them as they're, they're traveling out. And the Bible says there's a large crowd that's also following. There's like a, 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 a maybe a mob of some sort kind of coming behind them right we might call it there, there's a big group with them following them physically walking with them on the road and then sitting over there beside the road hearing this large crowd of people understanding that Jesus was nearby these two blind men called out for mercy they called out to Jesus for mercy right and they didn't, they, it was mercy that they wanted. They didn't demand something like it was owed to them or like they were entitled to it, like, like Jesus needed to do this for them. After all, he's Jesus and they're them and I should, they, he should do it for me. It wasn't like that. They were pleading for mercy. They said it, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, son of David. And specifically, they wanted their, their blinded eyes to be opened, Right? Now, what I want us to do real quick is just to think about the eyes that were open or opened 
during this event. Jesus' eyes were already open, right, to see these blind men, first of all, right? Our Lord sees us. He sees individual people. He sees groups of people. He sees nations. He sees churches. He sees us and he sees our needs. He sees our desires. He sees our struggles and our obstacles and our failures and our, our flaws and our shortcomings. He sees it all and he gives us mercy. Now, you know, sometimes we think, well, yeah, if he looked at us, he'd see we need it. Right. But sometimes we look at people and we see what they need and we say, well, they don't deserve it. Jesus sees it all. He could very well go, It'd be worth, I'd be wasting my time. But he doesn't, he sees us and he gives us mercy. We're not just another face in the crowd, one who can't really be seen or heard. He sees us and he came to this world for those who would recognize their need for him and who would cry out to him for mercy like these two blind men. And it's those two blind men who are, of course, the next folks who had open eyes in this event. Physically, their eyes were blind when they met Jesus. But spiritually, these guys probably had eyes that were more open than many in the crowd. They knew Jesus was their hope. They knew Jesus possessed the power to, to help them. And they believed that Jesus was merciful to do this for him. That he had it in him to show this kind of compassion. To be this kind of helpful on these, these, uh, these poor souls sitting by the road. And of course, verse 34 says that Jesus was moved with compassion and he went over and he did open their physical eyes, giving them their sight back. And what does it say happened next? These guys followed Jesus. It says, and they began to follow Jesus. And then next, real quick, the third group who had open eyes it would have to be the crowd. The crowd here. I, I've got to think that there were several in the crowd that day who surely had their eyes opened when they saw Jesus see these blind men and open their eyes. The focus and the vision of, of, of several of these people in the crowd, I'm sure, had to have changed. The perspective that they had uh, had to have changed from what they had before. After witnessing this, and now think about it. I want you to picture the situation. If you read the text closely, what happens next? These guys begin to go with Jesus. So the, this crowd now is walking and talking with these two formerly blind men. They're part of the crowd walking down the road with them now. As they're seeing this, and experiencing this, I've got to think that they, they started to, to see people differently now. That they, they saw Jesus differently now. And that they understood mercy and compassion differently now. That would be a sight to behold. That, that should change you. Now what should we learn from this? Well as Christians, we're supposed to see like Jesus. That much is clear. We probably knew that before we came in the building. And then some of us here might be like the, these blind men needing to trust in Jesus, knowing his power, recognizing his willingness to help you, and knowing your need for him. Others of us in the room are, are formerly blind. Jesus has already opened our eyes in a spiritual way. And again, he opened them so that we might see as he sees <clears throat> but it's also realistic to, to recognize the fact that there may be some within uh, uh, this large crowd that is following Jesus. There may be some in this crowd of, of Jesus followers who don't see people like Jesus sees people. Who may, like, like the crowd that was leaving Jericho yesterday, be stern, the Bible says, with those who were seeking Jesus instead of compassionate with them. Jesus chose compassion over blindness. He actively chose to see those who were in need and he was moved with compassion, the Bible says. Let's follow Jesus' example. Now before we totally finish up here, I, I want to just point out very quickly that ultimately Jesus' commitment to compassion, it's seen in the cross. There's the ultimate uh, uh, showing of his compassion, right? And in all the ways that we talked about, it was there that Jesus showed compassion over convenience, right? The cross was a, boy, it's an understatement, but, but we could say it was an inconvenient way for Jesus to demonstrate his compassion, but he did it anyway. There again at the cross, Jesus showed compassion over odds. Death on the cross had the look of, of loss rather than victory, right? had the look of, of, of losing. Jesus looked like a loser on the cross, but he was a, an ultimate victor, right? Jesus trusted the Father's plan. Again, at the cross, Jesus showed compassion over debts. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. He could have said, we owe too much. 
We owe too much. We'll never repay the debt. And he could have just simply left us to spend eternity in a, a torturous debtor's prison. But Jesus had compassion and paid the sin debt that was completely ours. We, at one time, felt like it was what we wanted to do. We, it wasn't dropped in our laps. We, we took it on ourselves. He paid it for us. And then finally at the cross, Jesus chose compassion over blindness, seeing all those who were in need of him. Even those who were blind to their need, right? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And through his compassion on the cross, he even opened some eyes, didn't he? Like the Roman centurion at the foot of the cross who finally recognized, uh, Scripture shows us, he finally recognized Jesus as the Son of God and a truly innocent man, the Bible says. This was a Roman military officer tasked with supervising the execution of Christ, eventually uh, praising God is the quote in Luke 23, 47. This military officer uh, watching over the, the execution of the Christ, praising God from the foot of the cross. Have you benefited from the compassion of the Christ? We all have. Aren't you glad Jesus overcame the inconvenience of it all? Aren't you glad Jesus overcame the odds and gained victory through death? Aren't you glad that Jesus overcame your debts, dying to erase them for you? Aren't you glad Jesus overcame blindness, giving you an opportunity to have your eyes open to see his salvation being offered to you? What have you done about it? Or what will you do about it today? Today.